spring offensive in France. Every last ounce, every last hope. Hindenburg wrote, I hope that with our first great victories, the public at home would rise above their sullen brooding, the apparent hopelessness of our struggle, an impossibility of ending the war otherwise than by submission. Ludendorff flung all his restless energy into planning the Kaiserschlacht, the imperial battle that would win the war. The blow would fall on the British, astride the Somme on a front of 40 miles. The German advance would split the British from the French and sweep them into the sea. December, January, February, March, every man, every gun, every lorry, every horse that could be spared flooded into France and Belgium. From generals to privates, the army was trained for breakthrough and pursuit. The objective of the first day must be at least the enemy's artillery. There must be no rigid adherence to the plans made beforehand. The fastest, not the slowest, must set the pace. Behind the front line divisions, 47 specially trained and equipped attack divisions and 6,000 guns were stealthily slotted into place. On March the 10th, Hindenburg issued the final order for Operation Michael. His Majesty commands the Michael attack will take place on March the 21st. Break into the first enemy position at 9.40 a.m. Haste, desperation, supreme effort. German soldiers were infused with a sense of destiny. The brazen spirit of the attack, the spirit of the Prussian infantry, swept through the massed troops. One can only be amazed again and again at the preparations being made, down to the last detail. That is, after all, the source of our greatness. The men were in good form. It was enough to hear them talk of the coming event as the Hindenburg Stakes in their dry Lower Saxon way, to know that they would fight as they always did, with an absolute reliability and without a word too many. The great attack will succeed. It must succeed. The breakthrough will free Germany from her hunger and suffering. It will bring us victory. So, over the top and forward. This was the decisive battle. The final reckoning, the culminating attack. The atmosphere was extraordinary, heavy with tension and excitement. We are really conscious of the greatness of the hour. On the other side of no man's land, there was also desperate haste. The British and French trenches had been only jumping off lines for past offensives. Now, under the threat of the German onslaught, they had to be converted in a few weeks into deep defensive systems. Not enough men to dig trenches and lay out barbed wire. Not enough men to fill the defenses. Not enough time to rest the survivors of the battles of 1917. Not enough time to train the scanty reinforcements. The French and British looked towards Germany and wondered how long they would be given. In the trenches at night, when the wind was in the right direction, we could hear the German transport and trains rumbling up their great army from the east that was going to sweep us into the sea. We were grim. We were determined. Behind us lay the old Somme battlefields, every yard soaked with British blood. They were determined that they were tired, deadly tired. March the 5th, 1918. The battalion wants a rest. It had been up 42 days when last night it was relieved, and even now I doubt whether a rest is in sight, since an order has just come in to go up tomorrow for the day and dig. I leave you to imagine the state of the men's bodies and clothing after so long a time almost without a wash. The British had pieced together the German plan, a tremendous blow against the British army. They comforted themselves with the belief 
If Germany attacks and fails, she will be ruined. The British Fifth Army, holding the longest and weakest sector in Haig's line, 12 infantry divisions to 42 miles, lay in the path of the German mass. Behind the Fifth Army was Amiens, the rail center that linked the British and the French. March the 20th, 1918, a cold evening, mist forming, apprehension prickling along the forward defenses. Night fell. I couldn't sleep. A quietness I knew so well falls over fronts before an attack. The quietness was on. I fell into an uneasy sleep. Stroke of 4.40 a.m., March the 21st, 1918, the German guns fired together all along the fronts of the British 5th and 3rd Armies. 4,000 field guns, 2,600 heavy guns, 3,500 trench mortars, high explosive shell, shrapnel, mustard gas, phosgene gas. The bombardment had been orchestrated into a great symphony of destruction. It swept away guns, headquarters, telephone exchanges, trenches. The amount of firepower by the enemy was so great that those who weren't gassed or suffering from the effects of gas would be numbed by the shock of the continual bombardments. The bombardment was concentrated into only five hours. The German gunners worked with the speed of frenzy. It was like the end of the world. The gunners have their shirt sleeves rolled up. They are bathed in sweat. Never have they fired faster. In the forward area, the British waited for the hurricane to cease. Waited for the German battle groups to loom up through the fog that covered the front. moment arrived and we rushed out of our trenches. A wild exultation seized us. Anger, drunkenness and bloodlust all rolled into one. We crossed the enemy's barbed wire without difficulty and were in his first line. The wave of men seemed to dance like a row of ghosts in the white whirling mist. The British in the forward area were outnumbered. They were swamped by the German advance. By the end of the day, the Germans had smashed gaps through the British defence into open country. British heavy artillery was dragged from long static positions in the rear and hauled away westwards. The British front trembled or crumbled beneath the weight and force of the German tidal wave. March the 22nd, disintegration and collapse. 
The Germans flooded through the British defence system all along the front of the 5th Army and on part of the front of the neighbouring 3rd Army. Haig wrote